Uh, thank you for all coming, right? Um, my name's Chris. Uh, I'm a principal cloud architect here at AWS. I've been with AWS about six years now, coming up to six year anniversary. Um, and I've done a lot of things with uh, AWS over the years and a lot of the, lot of the companies on the terrace, uh, interesting with IoT and, and other stuff. But for the last couple of years, I've been working in the SaaS, uh, the realm of SaaS transformation. Um, and it's an interesting, it's an interesting topic, uh, especially for companies who want to become SaaS because as, you'll, as I'll, I'll push home during this presentation, it's not necessarily just about the technical uh, side of things, but if you're a company that wants to become SaaS, there's a whole lot from your business side and your operating model and everything else that needs to go with it. So it's always quite interesting, um, uh, interesting to work on SaaS transformation projects. <clears throat> that said, I'm a developer at heart and I'm always on the technical side a lot more than anything else. And there's, uh, there's a lot to learn about SaaS and, and, and how to build SaaS correctly. And I realized that there's just not a lot of it out there. I mean, there's, there's a lot on, on reInvent and YouTube and stuff like that, but there's nothing kind of local. So I wanted to start a series called the SaaS on AWS series. Um, so these, these talks are in addition to the normal user group talks. And I'm going to try and have them on the first Wednesday of every month. <clears throat> there won't be one in January, but the next one will be on the first Wednesday of February. Um, and the idea is, is that we'll have uh, any, of you, any of you, if you want to uh, present on anything to do with SaaS, any challenges or, or uh, cool ways of overcoming things like tenant isolation, all the stuff that I might talk about today, um, and also partners and ISVs, I might get them in to, to help explain uh, how you can build better uh, SaaS applications. Um, <clears throat> so we've got, a, um, well, I've got an hour, I'll probably spend a good 50 minutes of that talking, so, uh, and it's, there's quite a lot of information. I thought I'd do this talk first at the beginning of the series because it kind of sets the scene. Um, we will have a lot of uh, diagrams and we'll get into uh, the nitty gritty of, of you know, data partitioning and, and um, tenant isolation, all these terms. If you don't know what they are, I'm going to be talking, I'll, I'll be telling you what those are to start with, right? So I'll just spend a couple of slides on what is SaaS. Like, is anyone here working in SaaS, like on SaaS applications at the minute? Yeah? Okay, cool. So there's, a, there's a few people here that so might know what I'm talking about, right? And you can hold me accountable, which would be working good. On or working, with? working on or working with? Okay, that's cool. With. Both. Yeah, cool. Yeah, well then you might understand how they how they kind of work and run. Um, so this is from the the, um, the aspect of being a SaaS provider and how to build on AWS and what the components within it. I'll talk a bit about the terminology, dive into some, um, <clears throat> just explaining some concepts. Two of those concepts are the control plane and the application plane. So I'm gonna dive into those and show a couple of patterns in there. So <clears throat> when I do any of these talks, and I don't know if you went to the Perth Cloud Day, I also did a talk there about the SaaS mindset. You know, it is a business model first. Um, and you know, I get approached by customers and other people like, you know, how do we, how do we turn this into a multi-tenant what's or what's or how do we use the S3 to the best advantage, et cetera, et cetera. And before we can really give an answer to that, we have to understand what the business realities are of the business moving to SaaS, right? Because that's going to affect your architecture. There's many different ways to do things, as you'll see throughout this presentation. Um, so I like to, when I say that back to people, I say, well, you know, from the aspect of the business, why are they moving to SaaS? Why would the C-suite or the board actually care that you're actually going to be a SaaS provider? <clears throat> and it comes down to these things. Obviously, agility, agility of being in the cloud, right? SaaS applications give you that, that amazing uh, advantage of spinning up uh, environments and actually getting products out there quickly um, compared to sort of capital expenditure projects in data centers that might take six months. An IT department has to provision hardware for the HR department to have a new software. Now, you know, you can actually provide these things really quickly. In, in coupling with that, you can innovate, right? You can actually... Um, you can try things out, A-B testing, uh, you can get feedback on, on it and you can actually pivot or persevere on your product roadmap and you can um, seek out new uh, customer markets, right? That's all well and good, but of course a lot of things that we want to move towards as well is, is operational efficiency and cost efficiency that can come with it, right? If you are um, going to SaaS model and we're not installing stuff on-prem or looking after things like that, you can have uh, your operations team looking after many customers. Uh, and, and I like to say, you don't really need to scale your operations team proportionally with the number of customers. Actually, some of the best internet providers out there have a very lean run team, right? Uh, and so that's what, that's what will give you that operational efficiency and that, the, the costs at the end of the day driving it down. 
Aiming for growth, you know, a, a business would want to be able to enter new markets. That's coupled with the ability to, you know, get the feedback from that, that agile product roadmap that you're now able to do. Multiple releases, you know, every week, right, rather than once a quarter. And that reduced cycle time. So how quick is it for a business to be able to want to use your product to them to be able to actually use it, right? In the old days, installing stuff on-prem, it's a big, long process, uh, and it takes six months. That's no good. People don't want that anymore. Go into SaaS or get that. So all of those things there, there's nothing technical in there, but the reasoning behind a lot of those things will drive your technical architecture. So just kind of bringing it back. And I've got <clears throat> my one and only wordy slide coming up. But I wanted to kind of define what SaaS was before I dive into kind of technical concepts. Um, and it kind of level sets because, you know, I've got a definition of what SaaS is and what we have and other people might, might not, right? So it's going to be wordy, but I'll, I'll go through it power by paragraph. SaaS architecture is not about being any one technology or design. It's about a mindset and approach that produces an environment that enables SaaS providers to onboard, operate, analyze, and manage all their customers through a unified experience. Now that unified experience is key to it. All your tenants and all your, we call them tenants in the SaaS world, your customers, being able to manage those from, a, from the same experience gives you the ability to uh, scale your operations, uh, you know, you scale your customers without having to scale your operations team. A best practice SaaS architecture foregoes one-off or bespoke customizations, instead relying on the efficiency and acceleration that comes from being able to rapidly onboard, update and manage tenants collectively. Now what this is trying to get through, and I've got another slide on it later, is you don't want to be building snowflakes for uh, each customer, right? Lots of customizations. You're going to have the same common version, and be, I'll tell you about ways you can actually still tailor the experience later on. And a SaaS architecture's success is measured based on its ability to enable a SaaS business to maximize its agility, innovation, uh, growth, and cost efficiency. So tying it back to why you know, the, the C-level and the board actually want you to do it. And this, these are good guardrails at the bottom. As you as the technical people or whoever you are uh, dealing with SaaS, if you're not really doing stuff that's helping that, that at the bottom, then maybe you shouldn't be doing it, right? And you can use that as a prioritization lever. So hopefully that, that kind of makes sense. But I will dive into a few more of these concepts a bit later on. I can send out these slides later too. So let's dive just a little bit deeper into this. Um, some of the core SaaS terminology you might hear um, Tenants, I already mentioned tenants. A tenant is uh, effectively an instance of your customer in your system. Okay? And so you have multiple tenants, um, which should be your multiple customers up there. And I'm, I'm talking in, you know, I, people automatically think that SaaS is, you know, B2C, uh, like Spotify, that's SaaS, that's great, with millions of customers. But actually a lot of SaaS applications are B2B, right? Business to business. Uh, and they've actually only got tens or hundreds of customers, right? Um, and that will also change the way that you, you, you do your architecture. But, you know, what I've been dealing with mainly is, is B2B, right? I'll talk about data partitioning. This is just how do we sort and organize, like, the data in all our various things that we have, RDS, Dynamo, S3, things like that. De tenant isolation, I'm definitely going to be diving into this a lot more. So how do we stop one tenant uh, from accessing another tenant's data? company ending event, possibly, if that goes wrong. When we talk about SaaS identity, uh, and I'll go into this more, but this is, now we've got a user uh, coming into the system, I need to know which tenant he's associated with. And, you know, they might be using the same email address for multiple, uh, you know, customers might be using a Gmail address, but there's got to be a way of identifying a user to a tenant, right? So that's what we call the SaaS identity, and I'll talk about how you can propagate that through your system so you can do that in a low latency fashion. Onboarding, this is the other really key term, and I'll spend a bit of time on this as well. This is how you actually add people, add tenants into your system. And B2C is often self-sign up, um, but often, you know, B2B, it's not. It's an admin typing some stuff in. That kicks off a whole load of processes underneath to be able to set up the system so your tenants can actually log in and use it. Tiering, you'll have experienced this. Almost every SaaS application has, you know, basic uh, and premium uh, different experiences that can be given. So I'll be talking about that a bit later on. And metering and billing. So obviously you want to generate some income at the end of the day. So metering and billing refers to, you know, defining what units you are going to be charging your customers at and then uh, integration to those billing systems. So just a few terms there because I'm going to be talking about these things. So you might have heard the term multi-tenant, right? So we want to be multi-tenant. Uh, and what does that mean? Okay, so 
Being SaaS, does that mean that I just need to be multi-tenant? I need to be able to cater for um, multiple tenants in my system and make sure that they can't see each other's data? Well, yeah, I mean, you could, you could have a multi-tenant microservice. Uh, this, is, uh, this is in what we call the application plane, right? So this is generally, if you are turning a product uh, into a SaaS service, this is what you've got, right? This is where your product and feature roadmap lives and in your, your features that you're giving to your customers, we call that living in the application plane. It's another bit of terminology there. Um, but just turning that to the latest and greatest microservice multi-tenant architecture, we don't consider that the, uh, you know, being a SaaS service. There's another term that we will talk about, and that is the control plane. Now, the control plane is not a multi-tenant application. It is a, an internal app, so you can call it like, like an admin app for your application plane. So to be able to manage and onboard and view insights into your application, we have another application called the control plane and that deals with all that. And only, only your company, uh, your internal staff will be logging into the control plane, um, but you know, you'll be federating maybe identities into the application plane so your tenants will be going into the application plane. But unless you've got that control plane and you've got these cross-cutting concerns, of how, how you're able to onboard a tenant, how to manage the tiers. Maybe the tiers under the cover change the amount of, uh, you know, the size of your e EKS cluster and your tasks, et cetera. Um, being able to manage the tenants uh, and also get those metrics and analytics, that all happens in the control plane. Uh, and unless you've got that, you can't really at scale manage multiple tenants in your application plane. So the control plane is really important and key to the application plane. And as you'll see as we go through this, there's lots of ways of, different, of deployments and isolation that can happen in the application plane, and they can be different. But if you're, from the control plane's point of view, when you're looking at it, it's all the same like, at that point. Sorry, I got a question. Yeah. So is the application plane more like the early ages uh, uh, phase of SaaS, and today you rather have a control plane? So, um, so here is where all your product dev teams will be building out the features that your product manager, uh, product owner is telling you to do, right? This could be an EKS cluster, it could be a service application, it could be EC2s. So this is still your bread and butter, right? This is, this is what's delivering functionality to your, um, to your tenants, to your customers, right? When they log in, they're experiencing the web service that comes from the application plane. What I'm trying to say is, um, to be able to manage tenants at scale, you need something to manage this, right? Inside here, you need to be able to potentially create a new S3 bucket, right? That'll be, you know, every time we onboard a new tenant, that would happen from the provisioning process that's kicked off from the control plane. And I'll, I'll dive into a bit more detail about the control plane pattern in a minute, and then we'll go to the application plane too. So hopefully it becomes clear. Um, some more terminology. Um, and this is just a, this is gonna be a brain dump for you guys if you're not really SaaS oriented. There's a lot of stuff to learn here. Uh, silo, I'm gonna talk about silo, right? So let's say you've got your, uh, your application, it's a microservice application and there's a, you know, the web tier and, uh, and all that goodness. Being silo means that we provision cloud resources that are just for that tenant. They don't share anything, okay? So there's no shared, shared resources going on. And there's advantages and disadvantages to this, but that's what silo means, right? On the other side of the spectrum, we've got the pool model. The pool means that everything is shared. We've got, uh, perhaps you've just got one container that's running that's your web app that all tenants come into. And the microservice, the Lambda, or the other containers, they're all sharing the, uh, the tenants as well. And I'll talk later on about how you have to kind of switch context if you're in that pool mode. Um, but that's what we mean by pooled, like we're sharing stuff. It's more cost efficient being pooled but there's complexities that come with that about how you isolate between the tenants. It's nice and easy at this side, as we'll see later on, because you've got, you've got, you've got big boundaries between your tenants. But in reality, we have like this mix or bridge mode in the, in the middle, right? Um, a, a classic example is your web app. It's, it, it's, or, you know, it's often quite a safe thing to move to a pooled mode, and, uh, but everything else is kind of siloed underneath. So you can have this, this mixture. And I'm really, I'm gonna dive into that a bit more about how you can end up with mixed throughout your whole application. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Okay, so the next terminology is deployment versus isolation. Right, so now we're talking about you know, creating, if we're in the silo model, we need to create uh, cloud resources every time a new tenant comes on board. So we need to create, we might have a pooled microservice, but we're gonna create a database 
per tenant, RDS database, perhaps, Aurora. Now, are these databases isolated? The answer is that they're not, right? Because we're relying on the microservice to determine that, okay, I'm in the context of tenant one, I need to access tenant one, right, the data. But through misconfiguration or even malicious coding, you could actually still access the, uh, the other, other tenant's data, right? Just get a different connection string. There's nothing stopping that. So that's where the term isolation comes in. We have to actually not trust the code that's running to do the right thing, and in fact, we put boundaries around it. And in, in AWS, you can do that nicely through IAM policies. So we actually, when that microservice is running in the context of tenant one, the only thing it can do is access tenant one's resources. And I'll talk about how those isolation things work later on. But there's two different things here. So there's deployment and isolation. I'll go through deployment models in a bit, and I'll go through the isolation constructs as well. Um, last couple of slides before we dive into the control plane. Uh, there's no real, there's no blueprint for SaaS, right? We can't just say, right, I've got my product, and now I want to turn it into SaaS. I go to GitHub and download and install a CloudFormation template. Away we go. Um, you can't really do that because there's so many different variables, um, different starting points, right? You might be a, already a large enterprise, or you might be a startup. Um, there might be different reasons for you going to SaaS. You might want to get to the market quicker, or you might just increase your operating margin, right? All those things there will change what you uh, need to be doing in your architecture when you're building it. So what you can do though, there's lots of reference architectures. So if, you, if you're going to get into SaaS, uh, is to really learn these as much as possible. There's different ways of doing metrics and analytics, right? You could use the ELK stack, you could use you know, Redshift, you could use all sorts of things there. Billing and provisioning, those type of providers there. There's different ways you can do that. The application, loads of different ways of doing isolation and the deployments I was just talking to. How are you going to write your tenants in? Are you going to have a subdomain per tenant? All those type of things there. There's reference architectures out there to help you with that. The tenancy, you know, how are we actually going to onboard and pass that identity through? All these things will converge uh, unless you can kind of create your SaaS application from there, your architecture. But you've got to lay over the top extra things like domain requirements. Is there any regulatory requirements? Um, you know, I was talking about a minute ago, like time to market. These are the pressures that are going to be going in as well. So this is why we say there's no blueprint for SaaS, but we can, you know, there's definitely a lot of things out there that can help you, um, you know, find the right path through. Okay. So a little breather, we'll go on to the control plane, and that might help understand what the control plane does. So I was saying it's one of the most important things that we, you need to do, is to have a control plane. So let's, let's talk a little bit about it. One of the main things that the control plane, and one of the first things you should do, like if you're sassifying an application, is figure out how you're going to onboard tenants into the system. Okay? Um, and that is a feature of the control plane. Right? It shouldn't be part of your application. You know, you don't need to onboard tenants within your application, or else you probably get into a crazy loop. Um, so you have the registration API. I'm showing it's a serverless application. It makes it nice and easy here because there's different microservices. But you have some sort of tenant management, which would capture the data. It might be your, you know, if it's B2B, it might be just the, the company, the, the admin email, and the, the phone number, those type of things there. And maybe what tier they want to uh, use. Then you're going to have to do something with identity, right? So you have to maybe, if you want them to have single sign-on, you have to federate. You know, you have to you have to do that, right? So you might use you might use Cognito for that, and then use the federation inside of that. So there's a bunch of things that you have to do from there that you have to do. Um, you got user pools, like if you're using Cognito, you could have multiple user pools, a single user pool. Um, you might have to, uh, if you're using SSO, create an app client if you know about Cognito, so that you can actually have your own domain coming in. Also, depending on your isolation approach, which I'll talk about in a bit, you might have to create some IAM roles so that you can actually uh, use those it, when you're in that, the context of that tenant. So a bunch of stuff that happens like identity. Billing, right? If you've got a billing provider, you, know, you need to let them know that you've got a new tenant coming on board. Uh, so you need to poke that and say, hey, new tenant coming, get ready for some data that's coming in with this tenant ID, and then we can charge them and make some money. Then, you know, one of the last things, once you've set all that stuff up, you've now set the groundwork up for um, provisioning a tenant. Now, if you're in that pooled mode, there might not be much to do because everything's already deployed. Like when you installed the system, everything was deployed. But even I've found, especially in B2B, you might need to provision something like a, a DNS record, right? So to point it in and maybe a, an ALB listener rule. Uh, but if you're in the silo mode, 
you've actually got to kick off some process now to go and deploy, which is quite interesting because in your existing systems, deploying stuff, your CI CD is normally triggered by a, a code commit to GitHub, uh, PR merge, and you'll trigger Circle CI or code pipeline, and then you'll go and deploy something. You now need to deploy something not on a Git commit, but on uh, you know, a, an onboarding request. So you've got to have some way of triggering those things. I've got another slide that talks about this in a bit more detail, but before I get to that, I'll just talk about tier-driven onboarding. And this, this comes hand in hand with whether you're going to do pooled or siloed. Um, but let's say you're, you're, you're registering and you've got your different tiers. At this point, you know, we configure our tenant, and that's all good. Um, if it's the platinum tier, Perhaps you know they, they get their own hardware, right? Or they get their own EKS cluster. Oh, question. Yeah. Um, you're talking about lambda usage, but do you have any use case for this process? I mean, which companies are using these? The, the whole procedure. Uh, so I'm just trying to this. I mean, you you could swap this. This could be a Java app if you wanted, right? This is on the control plane side. So this here is is. Um, just showing you that the functionality that needs to happen, right? So there's going to be a registration process, an API you need to hit to register a tenant in your system. And underneath, uh, that kicks off all these processes. You need some way of configuring an identity. Do you have a user case who's using this for procedure of you know, a large scale SaaS provider? Yes, lots. Yeah. So, I mean, most, most onboarding systems would need to do something like this. Uh, yeah. Uh, I can give you some details afterwards. And, and there's some reference architectures as well that you can have a look. So kind of ignore the lambda signals if that's confusing, but like it's the concepts of what you actually need to be doing is what I'm trying to say here. So you have some tiering, and if you are um, that platinum tier, you know, you might need a more beefier EC2 instance and you get your own one. You're not going to share it with somebody else. So you need to actually go off and, and do that. So this tiering filters through. It's not just like a sales plan. Uh, it actually filters through to your provisioning process. So here's a kind of bit of better example. So let's say we've got our pool, we've got our basic tier. They all share the same uh, microservices. And when we add in a new tenant, nothing really needs to happen, right? We've already provisioned those. But let's say we get a tenant now that comes along and they, they want the platinum tier. Regulation says that they have to have, they can't even share any cloud infrastructure. Um, that needs to now kick off that process that I was talking about. So you need something like Code Pipeline to go and deliver these, uh, these um, cloud resources and, and deploy them into your systems. The, um, the nuances here come, are quite interesting in that, you know, I was saying, well, I'll tell you in a minute that everyone should be running the same version of your software. So if you've got your order microservices on 1.1 and you need to deploy a bug fix or a new feature, that rollout now needs to cater for some are in pools with multiple tenants running, and some of them are siloed. So your DevOps and provisioning in a SaaS world just kind of need to step up a little bit because it's now, as I said, not just coming from a Git commit, CI, CD, deploy. Now there's like deploy stuff on demand and also rollout fixes, and some things are deploying in one sense, and some, ploys, some things are deploying in another way. So that's how the tiers can actually affect where you're deploying things to. Typically, that's what we see is the tier decides whether things are siloed or whether they're, they're pooled. OK, moving on. Um, the other thing about a uh, control plane, so that's really the onboarding, that onboarding process, that onboard DevOps and provisioning. That's something that needs to be orchestrated by the control plane. Tenant aware identity. So this is coming into that identity that I talked about earlier on. So which user, which tenant is this user from? Um, and we do that by Pushing, some, uh, pushing the tenant into the JWT, right? the, the JWT token, if you, if you know what that is. It's just from the OR flow. So our tenant logs in, gets redirected. This is just a typical flow. The identity provider provides an access token and an ID token under the covers. What we're doing uh, in the SaaS world is at the identity provider point, when we're getting the JWT, we're injecting which tenant it, it's coming from. So um, we are doing a tenant lookup. And, and we're putting that inside the JWT. And the beauty of doing that is we pass that token all the way through the, to the application service. In Lambda, it gets passed through as a context variable, but you can pass it through in any other way if you're using Fast API or any of your, your, um, you know, your web servers of choice. You should have access to that, that token. Now, putting it in the token is really key because when we get down to uh, pooled compute, like a, 
um, Lambda or anything that's doing some compute needs to know where it is. You don't want to be having to do a lookup, right? So, okay, now I'm, something's happening. I need to find out which tenant it's from. If you're going to call another microservice to find out what tenant it is, you know, which tenant that user's from, you're going to add latency. So putting it into the uh, token and passing it through the system is, is a really kind of latency-free way of pushing it through. And that's what we call the SaaS identity. I've got another example here, which is a bit, bit more in depth here. So we've got the tenant that logs in, tenant1.example.com comes in here. Um, this example is when we're using multiple user pools per tenant. Um, but this is kind of similar to the same if it's a single user pool. We need to make a, a call. So we do need to know at this point, which if we've got multiple user pools, which one are we going to be authenticating against? Which one are we going to ask to be using? So we can, you can put that into the, um, into the control plane, and it can make a, make a call to it just to find out the user pool. So there's not much information going there. It's just, yes? Yeah, it's like a grouping of users, right? It's got a, a user pool, it's literally a, a pool of users. Um, and that's how you can, you can apply um, constructs to it, such as like password policies and, and things like that, right? Um, you can have, like, there's two models. You can have a single user pool and all your tenants go into it. And you, like, if you looked at the user, list of users in there, you'd have all your different tenants, all different email addresses, like domains in there. Or some people go for a user pool per tenant. Uh, because then you can have custom policies per that tenant. It means you've got to create a user pool every time you onboard a tenant. Uh, and also you need to know which user pool you're, you're authenticating against. So it's basically when you ask Cognito to, uh, to go and um, authenticate, you've got some request to authenticate, it's like, where am I looking it up? Cognito say, oh, right, it's this user pool. That user pool is connected to this tenant's Azure AD, something like that. So you go off and... So come back a little bit. We go off and get that. We store it away just in, in the browser. Now we know which user pool we're authenticating against. Then it's a typical OAuth flow, and we get our token back. So we get our JWT token. But at that point, we've injected into it what tenant it is. Because in, in Cognito, you can, before the, the JWT is issued, you can actually have a, a Lambda hook. So just during login, we do that tenant lookup. And for the lifetime of that, that, that token being valid, it's being passed through the system. It goes into your product. So that, that whole thing there is just really, you need to be sorting this out. And this typically is not in your application plane. You know, you need to be doing that outside as part of what we call the control plane. Where's the first place to tag the JWT? Uh, you can just put a, 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 like a custom scope in there. Yeah, a custom claim. Uh, I'd put a claim in there. It depends whether you want to see it in the ID of the access token, like a, or the, the ID token, right? So um, the not having a scope, because scopes you have to kind of request, so I'd have it as a claim. Yeah. Do you do that as a custom claim? Would you put in the pre-token generation? Or? Yeah, you, so you can, you can inject it as a, as a custom claim in there, because you'd have to do it after you've... You, what would happen is the flow would normally go, you know, you get the code from the uh, Azure AD, it would come back, but before Cognito issues the JWT, yeah. you can make a hook in at that point, check up your database, okay, that identity provider is tenant one, so I'll do custom claim, tenant scope equals but I shouldn't call it scope, tenant equals um, you know, tenant one, right? And then that's now in there, and we've issued that JWT, it gets passed through the system, if that makes sense. Um, billing, I'll just quickly talk about this. This is another thing that the control plane would have to set up. Remember I was saying you have to poke that, that system. You kind of have to choose your billing provider. AWS doesn't you know, really do uh, anything well in the, in the, you know, build your own really billing provider, so go to a third party. But each one of these is different, so you kind of have to choose Choose one. It's a bit of a one-way door decision once you've done this because you know, you know you'd be custom setting up your APIs. But the idea is that you configure your plan. When your SaaS application comes on board, in onboarding your application, um, you create that customer inside the billing provider, and that then allows the billing provider to know that you're going to be starting to send data to it, so that you can actually go and generate your bills. Okay. So something else that has to be done as part of that billing, if you remember in that, that first sense of the things that need to be done as part of the um, onboarding process. And I think it's uh, one of the last ones on the control plane, uh, just about metrics. Now, SaaS is kind of data driven. You need to understand how your SaaS application is performing. Uh, you need to know what success looks like. And you really need like a bit of an observability strategy, right? You can, you can pump out metrics left, right, and center if you want it. And there's multiple ways to do it. You could do it through native services, or you could use the Elk stack. Um, but really, you need a way of aggregating those. And also, more importantly, is having a tenant dimension to it. 
So now you're getting metrics from your application plane, which is the same piece of code, but running it in the context of different, different tenants. You need to be <clears throat> outputting in your structured log format what the tenant ID is, so that you can then, um, in the logs and the metrics, you can then filter and then actually tell what's going on per tenant. Because the idea is in that application, that control plane, you're going to have a dashboard that can tell you the health of all your tenants, and they'll roll up, and then you can see that tenant one is you know, using more of something or other, and tenant two isn't, but to be able to do that, you need to be instrumenting your metrics to have that tenant identity inside it. So everyone says, yes, that's great, and then actually you've got to do that, right? And this is actually not just in the control plane, you have to tell your developers in the application plane to go and change the way they're doing their logging. Um, and you can do that with, as you see later, you can things like Lambda layers, or, or you can, the logging constructs, you can actually uh, hide away the implementation of how they can just pass it to JWT and you know, it, it automatically adds the uh, tenant context to your, uh, to your metrics. All right, how are we doing for time? Okay, good. Everyone's still alive. If anyone wants a drink, I won't, be, I won't mind if you go out and get one. Um, <clears throat> application plane. So, a few more slides for this one. Here's my brain dump. Some patterns for the application plane, right? So, I talked about this before. You can deploy different versions of your software for different customers. <clears throat> it's a valid model, and it's called the MSP model, right? Managed service provider. A lot of people, a lot of SIs make a lot of money on this. Um, but it takes a lot of resources to look after those um, you know, customized versions of your application. It's just not scalable, right? If you want to have hundreds of tenants or thousands of tenants, you know, if you're having to look after and know the nuances of what's been developed for one customer versus another one, the tax on your ops team it just goes crazy, and I'm not seeing it really scale that, that well. Um, on the flip side, what we're trying to aim for in the SaaS world is everybody's running the same version. So all the tenants, are running the same version, and we are, that means we can administer it all in the same way. It's hard to have a control plane that can manage multiple different versions if, if, you know, if, if things are so customized, right? Uh, if the API endpoints are different, et cetera, et cetera. If everyone's running on the same version, um, it's a lot easier. It means that you can roll out fixes, you can roll out updates <coughs> in a much better way. So, this has often been a bit of an eye-opener for customers when we say, oh, no, but you know, customer Y is definitely wants to pay us more, so we're gonna, you know, <clears throat> we, have to, we have to change their experience. Well, you can do that, and I'm sure you've all heard of feature flags. Everyone's heard of them, but hardly ever used them, right? So you should be using feature flags to change the experience of your tenants. <clears throat> that said, right, if you've got one tenant and they are asking for so many features that you end up with 100 feature flags that are only for that tenant, you probably might have been thinking, actually, is, is this right? Like, like, is SaaS the right model? Maybe MSP is the right model after all, right? So, so, so use it, but just be aware that don't abuse it. Um, you should try and have eventual consistency, I guess, for your, for your customers. Okay, so back to application planes. So now we have to talk about deployment and isolation. <clears throat> so I'll start with the deployment models. We have the... Um, the, the full stack silo model. This is actually a really good starting point because if you've already got an app, you've obviously more than likely got a CI CD process that deploys it. So you've got some deployment scripts, you've got some CDK or, or Terraform that's going to deploy all your cloud resources. Um, <clears throat> if you're starting out, the full stack silo is actually a really good way to go because you can, you can use that script and for each tenant just deploy a new set of cloud resources. It means you don't have to refactor that code, you can actually spend a bit more time on your precious developer time on building out the onboarding and the, and the tenant identity first. <clears throat> you can then slowly move across to more of a pool model later on. But the full stack silo model is, is just that. It's just like, pfft, just deploy everything with that customer. The pool model is you know, the extreme opposite, right? So you've just got, you deploy it once, and then for every tenant that comes on board, it's just going to use the slices within it and the constructs. This, again, uh, directly goes to the, that, that tier-driven model. Your advanced tier might also be using this, so you might stick with the full-stack silo model. Even in the future, after you've like, been in the SaaS game for quite a while, you might stick with this because for a premium tier, you need to be deploying cloud resources for every tenant. Um, <clears throat> the basic tenants, the basic tier might not care about you know, so much throughput uh, and that type of thing, so you can, you can uh, <coughs> have them all using the pool model. <coughs> So the patterns for full stack silo, how can we do this? 
accounts really nice, right? Because they're just like, you can't accidentally create a cross account role that's going to access another account tenant's data. So the, um, later down the line, when we're talking about tenant isolation, this is really nice because um, it just gives you all these constructs out of the box that completely segregate tenants. Uh, <clears throat> just on the accounts though, you have to be a bit aware. I think my next slide might talk about that actually, uh, is just about how far you can go, right? Uh, how far can you push the, account, uh, the accounts? What's a bit more common is you have a VPC per tenant. That also gives you nice constructs uh, in IAM and everything else. <coughs> that also gives you, I've been told to speak up a bit more <coughs> as my voice is dying. Uh, so VPC per tenant is actually uh, you know, a bit more common. And then you can actually, uh, if you have a control plane and you actually, either of these, it, the control plane doesn't really care how you deploy it. That's how you should configure things, right? Is that the control plane doesn't really care how it's deployed. It just knows that it can manage it because everything's on the same version, which is great. The silos have, have, have their limits though. As I was saying, if you've got tens of customers, accounts might be good, right? But if you've dealt with lots of accounts, uh, they get a bit unwieldy, right? If you're going into the hundreds, thousands, uh, not only does AWS, the, the uh, org team probably get a bit uh, annoyed with us for recommending it, so I'm not recommending it, but there are good, there are good use cases for going accounts, right? If you've only got tens of customers. But if you're going into the thousands, think about other ways here. But even like just from the resources point of view, how many you can deploy in an org, you know, the, um, the compute that you can have and, and VPCs, et cetera, there are soft limits and there are some hard limits. Okay, so if you're going that silo model, uh, you've got to just be aware of that. There might be a limit at which you can't do it anymore. Okay, and then you might have to think about going to the pooled architecture. So full stack pool sat, um, patterns, that's, uh, that's um, Fairly straightforward and self-explanatory, really. You just have a, a one VPC that can handle all your tenants and then we deploy everything into it. You might, have, might be running on EKS, just a cluster in there that's servicing everything. We just deploy into that. And you know, microservices and uh, Lambda functions, again, we just deploy those in and that, that's all pulled there. One more, one more thing that I've seen a little bit more is, is this kind of pod deployment model where you've got not, well, not silo, uh, silos and pools uh, is not really the right term, but you've got pods of, of pool models. And the reason you might want to do this is to have a bit of segregation. Maybe you've got one pod in one region and another pod in another. But also, you know, I was working on a, um, a project very recently where we're using uh, the pooled architecture, had an application load balancer, and every time we onboarded a tenant, we added a listener rule and they could route on host header to, to get to the right um, destination behind it, right? And, and set the tenant context. There's limits on that and how many you can have. So we might have uh, one pool that can handle up to 100 tenants. And then uh, once that's expanded, then you deploy a new pool pod and then you can have it there. So you can do that as well. So that's something that we've also seen. Again, control play managing all that doesn't really care if it's in multiple pods. It's just, yeah, just that place to manage it. <clears throat> um, this is probably one of the most important styles I want to do, right? So talking about silo and pooled uh, in that deployment, we, in reality, it can be mixed, right? So I'll, I'll walk you through a fictional website, you know, a couple of, couple of microservices. We want to make an order on e-commerce website. Um, in this case, we could have silo compute. For some reason, we decide that the, you know, the Lambda functions have to be dedicated, right? But actually, when we're just, uh, we're just storing those orders, we can put it into, the, uh, into a pooled database. It might be a DynamoDB table. Um, later on, you know, when we get into the product microservice and we're just looking up stuff, okay, you're just looking up products, you just have one, one service that does that uh, for all tenants. You have got one Lambda function or one, one uh, you know, bit of Java doing that, and then you've just got, again, one DynamoDB table or one Aurora database. So you've got pooled compute and pooled storage. Later on, when we get to the invoicing, we want to keep that data completely separate. We can use the same, uh, same code, uh, like the compute code, but actually we store the data in siloed, um, in siloed databases, right? So we keep it separate. And that doesn't have to be just about uh, compute and storage, we've actually, that can go into the, like, the queuing system, right? Do you have, do you have tenant, uh, a queue per tenant, or can you just put them all on the one there? And then coming back, you know, when you get the shipping, we might have the, uh, the pooled compute and pooled storage. What I'm trying to get across here is, is that it, you have to look at it from kind of each domain and choose which is the right pattern, okay? It's not just like, we have to go all pooled, or we have to be all siloed. Um, it's really dependent on your architecture. You know, there's no blueprint, right? You've got to just figure out what 
is the right thing for your application to go through. Hey. For extreme scalability or to handle a billion users, yeah. which, do you, what, which, which is the best way forward? Uh, well, I'll give a classic, it depends answer, because <laughs> uh, if you've got a billion users, right, you're going to have um, things like noisy neighbor, right? You don't want a group of tenants affecting another tenant, right? So you're going to have to change the way that you do things. And there might be, a, there might be the service that you've got, which is maybe a database, is going to be affected by massive throughput. So you're going to actually have a second database or 100 databases and groups of tenants in that, right? So again, that's just one of the factors that you'd have to look at if you had a billion uh, users coming through the system is looking at that. And where's the constraints, right? Where's the throughput and the throttling going to occur? And choose it because of that. All right. Mm. You run into a lot of complexities with regards to billing, especially if you're on billing usage to clients. What strategies do you have for dealing with that? Well, I think you're, you're probably talking more about the platform usage, <clears throat> which is, uh, you know, but there is also, you know, you've got your billing constructs. So when you go into a pool model, your application needs to be pumping out metrics that can apportion the usage to your, uh, to your tenants. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They're uploading data to a S3 buckets. Yep. And then you have, as a provider, you run analytics across all of those buckets. Okay? Um, now, it's better for you to use like, spot pricing, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that certain thing. Um, so you know you need it for four hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the question again, that you, you really have to look into your billing construct and have your billing strategy, right? Because it's not, depending on the service, it can be quite easy, right? Like to, to figure out how much, how to, how, how to apportion it, right? Uh, proportion it. Um, but I would suggest that, you know, it's, it's beyond this topic, but there's, there's a few things that I can point you to uh, that help with that. Uh, there's a great blog post on apportioning tenant cost. And it is, it is one of the more tricky things to do, right, if you're in the pooled architecture. So, yeah, it's not a straightforward answer and it's not an easy thing to do, but there are a few things out there that can help you, right? Yeah. Also, ask yourself about your business model, right? How your business model works. And maybe you don't need to apportion. Right? Um, if, if I'm getting just hypothetically, let's say a billion yeah. web requests into my service. And when it comes in, I know which tenancy those requests are for. Then I've got a percentage scale. Yeah. Mm. So if I know that running my service is costing me whatever, 10,000 a month, billion requests, I know what my request or service request on average is. But I, yeah. Right? And, and so I can proportion my costs if that's a reasonable <coughs> cost for my client. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, not everyone. If you, if you message me after, I'll send you. There's a blog post that I'm thinking of that will help you on that. I'm going to crack on a little bit because we uh, got 10 minutes left and I've got uh, a few slides to do. No, only another 60. That's right. No, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, getting into isolation now. So we talked about deployment. That's different isolation, right? So we need to be able to stop one tenant talking to another tenant. Okay, uh, through malicious or accidental code. So how are we going to do that? <clears throat> what are the patterns we've got available? Well, you know, in the, in the full stack isolation, it's quite nice. You've got those account boundaries. Um, probably the easiest one to do. But it's more costly because you're creating cloud resources, right, for each, each one. Um, the resource level isolation, you can have that S3 bucket per customer and that, that database per customer. Again, it's a bit easier, but you have to then look at that resource, that type of resource and what constructs it can give you that allow it. I mean, the databases are a bit different to, say, native databases like Dynamo as well, like if you're just looking at Aurora and other things. Um, so you've got to look at that. The interesting stuff comes when you've actually got really pooled data, right? be it in a database or you know, you've, you've got tenant you got one row from one tenant and the next row from another tenant, right? So how, how do you deal with that? So I'll try and touch on a couple of the ways that you can do that. So that resource level, as I was saying, you really just have to look at 
uh, this is where you've got a, a, you know, an S3 bucket per customer and a, um, you know, a Lambda per customer and that type of thing. Um, you actually, when you're using that in that, that kind of uh, diagram that I talked about, you've got that siloed uh, level. That's, you need to be looking at how, how what is available. There's lots of different things. Redshift is different to Aurora, it's different to DynamoDB, right? So you need to kind of get across what's going to work for that, that resource in particular. But that's more in that, that siloed way there. Um, we can deal with that a little bit uh, at the deployment time, right? So we've got the deployment-driven uh, resource isolation. So let's say we have to create some EC2s. When we create EC2s, we can create an instance profile. That instance profile there actually will lock it down to uh, being able to not be able to look at the other tenants' data. Uh, but it's kind of for the lifetime of that EC2. It's not very, it's, you know, uh, you can't really change your instance profile, right? It's the same for Lambda as well. Your lambdas get deployed with an execution role uh, and out of the box, you know, you can't change execution roles at, at, at runtime, but, uh, but that execution role is what you would use to stop it from uh, being able to access other, other data. All right, so that's what we call that, that deployment-driven isolation. So when we deploy a resource, we give it its isolation policy. But that's not gonna work again if we're in this pool model. So we've got this pool model here. How do we stop tenant one uh, accessing tenant three? Um, I'll pick, uh, so the way that you can do this is, is to change the scope of the um, uh, permissions at runtime, right? So what I do here is when I've got my, uh, my compute running in here, I would go off and find out what tenant I am. Like I'd, I'd crack open the JWT, I'd find that I'm tenant one, okay? And then um, I would actually be able to assume a role. So what I'm gonna do here is when I deploy that deployment time, I deploy my compute resources with a very limited scope. So if you know I am, like what you should do is just give it an assume role um, functionality and that's it. And if you're really into I am, you can use session tags as well to make sure that you can only access the right thing. It then assumes a role that is specific for that tenant and that gives it the context now to uh, do that. If you're using Boto3 and Python and anything like that, you go off and you call, you call, uh, uh, you assume your role and then you get that and everything else you do in that bit of code is in the context of now your assumed role, which is specific to that tenant. So that's the runtime force isolation. Just a quick question, is that not a call out to STS each time to assume that role though? Is that Just at the beginning, yeah. So uh, it, it can be, but you can have that in the, you know, you can kind of cache it as well. So you just need to be careful with how you, how you do things, right? Yeah. That, that's one way of doing it. There, there's another way of doing it. You can just use session policies as well, but that means you have to, kind of deploy with a broader scope and then you scope it down afterwards, right? So in, in reality, it's not, it hasn't been that much of, of an issue. So. Um, when we look at, you know, I'll pick DynamoDB for the data store because it's actually one of the easiest. We've got this IAM policy which can actually restrict what tenants you're going to, uh, going to look at using this uh, condition here, like leading keys, tenant one, that actually will uh, allow you to only hit the, uh, the Dynamo table rows that have that as your, as your uh, tenant there. So when you get that assume role and you get a policy that's created for you, you can have policy templates and it gets put in. Um, this is that tenant that gets put in down here. Hello. Yeah, so we know we've already got limited ways we can slice and dice down with Dynamo ADB. Is that just that the key value starts with that or the whole partition key would have to be that? That uh, starts with that, yeah. It starts with, so you yeah. can like yeah. have a value after yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Keep me honest later, but I think so. If I recall correctly. Um, every service though has its own uh, has its own complexity, right? So there's there's AWS, there's lots of ways of doing things and you're gonna have to learn which ways to do that when you come there, when you come to your pool, pooled uh, resource uh, isolation. Okay, last few minutes, sorry I've talked a bit too long. Uh, data partitioning, this is just really that term that I was talking about is actually how how do you segregate things in your databases, right? Um, how, do, how do you move them? Uh, like, how do you actually like, organize your data uh, just so you can access it with, uh, with the, the best efficiency? Uh, in the silo model, you can have your separate databases, but in the pool model, you know, in, uh, in more of an SQL world, you've got to think about how you're doing that, right? So you can access it better. S3 is really good. Let's just use that as an example. There's loads of different ways that you can organize your data. You can access it via tags or via prefixes, etc. But you have to think about that as well, as well as your I. Well, you need to think about the data partitioning first, as you're saying, and then and then figure out your isolation and your runtime isolation and go with it. Uh, 
last slide before a takeaway slide, so we made it, right? So um, just recapping, really identify different bits of your architecture because they're all going to be a bit different, right? Um, and a good way to do that is you know, domains, right? So for a particular domain of your architecture, have a look and see what fits, right? What, what resources are you going to be using and, and what's going to fit, whether you're going to have a siloed pool, compute, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, just go through your whole architecture. Cool. Takeaways, right? I think you'll figure out there's no one way of doing this, right? There's lots of different ways. Um, the control plane services are really essential. And if you're starting out, I would say go full stack silo and figure out your onboarding and that ways of deploying all those different ways of doing it, right? There you go. It's like I wrote that. Um, each AWS stack uh, requires a different approach. I've said that too, which is great. Mix everything up uh, and, you know, Things like your performance, like you were talking about, if you've got a billion customers, right? There's, there's lots of other things that are going to come into it. Um, noisy neighbor is that term of one tenant affecting another. I didn't really touch on it today, but we can, there's a whole, uh, whole talk I can do on that. And yeah, find the best patterns uh, that match you. Uh, that concludes my talk. Um, before I stop, there's a, there's a bunch of things to, to look at here. Um, the well-architected framework has a SaaS lens, which is really good. Uh, and there's actually a, a serverless SaaS reference solution that has a control plane and you can deploy. Uh, it's a, I think it's EKS based underneath, but you can deploy, deploy different tenants to it. Um, there's actually a whole bunch of stuff here though. Like if, if you go to this, we've got a, a team at uh, AWS called the SaaS Factory uh, that you can kind of choose. You can kind of see the different, the different categories that you want and this will find all your blogs. And if you've got billing and metering, you'd be able to find the blog that I was talking about. You can kind of go here and go and find that. Um, so, um, do go and have a look at these things if you want, and I'll send this out afterwards. Um, I will ask you if you can, because this is the first one of the SAS talk, I have got a little survey, and it take, it's like three questions, so if you, can, if you can fill that out. But I'd like to say thank you for sticking with me for 57 minutes and 44 seconds, uh, and any questions? Yeah. Uh, again, it's just one piece of the puzzle, right? So if you if you if you need EFS, uh, then then you're going to have to look at the constructs to to actually how you, how you can partition and isolate that data with it. To be fair, I haven't come across EFS in my in my SaaS uh, journey over the last couple of years, but it can be a thing. Um, I can't that slide. I kind of mentioned that there's so many. Um, all our services, right, they can all be applicable depending on your design. You could use all of them, right? You could, you could be using SageMaker to, um, you know, who knows what else, right? Elasticash and all those type of things. They've all got their own nuances about how you can data partition and do your tenant isolation. So you, you can, you'd, you'd have to look at it from that point of view. Yeah. Any other questions? In that example, I think you were talking um, sort, of, sort of like service accounts, but you sort of having access, like the tenant will have, will have access to the whole entire tenant. When you get to a user level, like if way the user in that tenant has mm -hmm. access to that particular part of the database. Uh, yeah, so that that's, comes down to your application plane, how you're kind of coding that, right? So, so when that comes in, um, you know, that, the, you've got a bunch of users there in the, the context of that tenant. So um, you can use your isolation at that point to, to make sure tenants don't talk to each other, but your application is, is kind of responsible for, I guess, authentication authorization about what it can, what it can do underneath that as well. Yeah. But a good point, authentication authorization is not an isolation context, right? You need to have something on top of that. Just had a question around like the design process for SaaS applications. Like, you mentioned before, like a lot of the stuff has like quotas and stuff like that, like user pools. Mm. You only have like a thousand in a region or whatever. Mm -hmm. right? Do you design for that limitation up front and go, like, okay, well, I'm going to use a single user pool, or is, is, is it more of like a we'll cross that bridge when we come to it and then redesign yeah. when it becomes a problem because it's a good problem to have, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think those type of things, those architectural things, you do need to. You know, whenever I'm working with customers, we have uh, you know design design decision spaces. And you've got option one and option two, and you have to have those pros and cons, right? How is it going to affect you? But it's, it's something to factor in, like later on down the line, um, are we going to migrate? But you know, our SaaS architecture generally evolves. Like you're not just going to get it right first time. And most customers I've seen, they start with full stack silo, and then they just layer. It's called layered migration. They just move piece by piece, right? And things just, just change as you kind of go along. So the thing is, you've got to think about if it's data, you've got migration paths and things like that. That's the that's the.
household. Uh, thank you uh, for the talk. Uh, regarding uh, this SaaS model, are there any like compliance requirements which drive mm -hmm. like a pool or a silo? Or Absolutely, yeah, they do. Uh, and often it's perceived compliance regulations because a lot of them, you know, the, the constructs of tenant isolation are good enough, but um, companies feel a bit more safer if they go with like a silo model because then they definitely don't have to struggle so much with those type of things, right? So, but they, yeah, it can definitely. You've got to know your customers, know your domains and know your regions. You know, if you've got customers in Europe, you've got GPDR regulations and things like that, uh, that can all come into it. And then there's, there's a bunch of other things you can use there, how you set up your landing zone and and control tower and things like that can help with those kind of things there. But yeah, they're definitely compliance, noisy neighbor. Um, I was talking from the control plane perspective and not from the ah. application plane perspective. So it's more from the, the control plane uh, will be, you know, you'll have to go through your security vetting, but it's a single tenant application, right? So it's just your internal staff. There's no multi-tenancy happening in the control plane. That's all happening in the application plane. So it's a bit more of a light touch, and it's often, as you see, just a bunch of lambdas kicking off step functions to do some orchestration. So the actual, um, you know, the, the complexity might be in your deployment scripts, et cetera, that you've got in a step function, but like as a construct of, you don't not really have to deal with multi-tenancy in the control plane, so it, it makes it a lot easier. Okay, thanks. Yes, come to you next. After you, yeah. <laughs> I'll probably go about two other questions, but um, <laughs> I look at this from a, my job is cybersecurity, assessing SaaS platform from cybersecurity perspective, so this would be really, really helpful. Yeah, cool. Um, going back to the compliance thing too, just looking at um, that is what you just said, they perceived that, you know, is they might want to silo thing, but then when you show that there's hybrid models, mm. so when you're, when you're assessing a platform, you're saying, are you a hybrid model or are you mm -hmm. a yep. shared model, <coughs> it might be a... Yeah. It might be a whole combination of that. And yeah. you know, the guys at the other end are probably looking at, at the questions going, oh, well, how do we answer it? Yeah, I mean, a better question is how are you, how are you enforcing tenant isolation, right? And then they would have to go through, like, each levels. I've just done it recently for a customer, you know, getting ready for a SOC 2 audit. And, you know, we have to, we documented the tenant isolation, all the levels, like, all the pieces that are in there, right? So, I've never seen that level. I normally yeah. just get it, like, a cloud formation thing like that says, this is our general security construct. Yeah. Yeah. Poke them harder. Yeah. Poke them harder. Get some. Get some. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think probably yeah. you know, if you're doing a series of these, maybe you should do it. Yes. Do one on security. security. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Over to you, sir. Mm -hmm. Because that would be really handy for this kind of thing where I, I know to avoid specific images because the licensing would just be you know, really strict for um, isolation. Don't use pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's down to the vendors, but you're right, you know, that would be nice. You know, there's some, some do that. You know, you have your different tiers. Yeah. Something ageless would do to say, this is good for pool, this is good for silo. Mm -hmm. and Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, I already handle 500,000 sites uh, and users, so I understand the tenancy and et cetera, the architecture and everything. Uh, I'm talking about extreme scalability because I'm looking forward to scale it to the next level. Yep. Uh, can you maybe share uh, what you think like applications like uh, WhatsApp or Canva, they're using in AWS, how would their back end, um, you know, how would their asset source architecture yeah, I probably can't do that now in a couple of minutes, but if you go to that SAS Insights Hub, um, uh, the SAS Factory, uh, if you look up AWS SAS Factory and you have a look at their references, there's actually a lot of references from companies you know, that are working with AWS, but anything on scalability as well, you can probably find in here as well, just t type into the search here, and you should be able to find uh, some blogs. There's a lot of content that's put out that will hopefully um, answer you. On the partner blog as well, there's often um, the partners being companies that work with, work with AWS, writing about their solutions as well, so you can get some ideas of what they're doing. Yes? Gathering up what other people said about the cybersecurity perspective and all that stuff, um, 
Yeah, I was just wondering how you manage the complexity. I, you talk about the IM roles when you're sharing resources. I think, I think uh, once you once you get into the point where uh, you talked about, you know, uh, each tenant having their own VPC and all that, but once you get into share a bit more resources, I was just wondering how you manage the complexity of those roles and all those permissions and all that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a trade-off, right? So that's the, that's, that is like silo is nice and easy, uh, but as you move to a pool, things get a bit more complex. But you do have things like dynamic uh, policies in IAM. Uh, assume role means that you have to create a role every time a tenant's onboarded. That can, that can hit limits as well. So you might look into ABAC, like uh, attribute-based access control, and we use uh, the session tags, principal tags, there's a bunch of things there that can make the process nice and easy and kind of transparent. You only have a couple of policies, but actually depending on the context and the tags that you're passing through, you can only access resources that are tagged with that customer. So yeah, it's, uh, it does add a level of complexity, but it is manageable. Yeah. I think that's bleeding through into doing identity in corporate, because we do corporate identity terribly. Yeah. <laughs> but this kind of environment, really forces you to do your identity properly because mm -hmm. you don't want to get that bleed. Mm, that's right. And I was just reading, I don't know if you read about the Google Workspaces today. No. No. I'll just yeah. read you a quick thing. I mean, it's very... Uh, there's a flaw that exists in Google Workspaces domain-wide that allows Google Cloud Platform to interact with and create tasks in Gmail and Google Drive for the rest of Google's SaaS applications. Oops. Yeah. And, and it's all to do with this mm. you know, Java Web Tokens being... People getting it wrong. When you're, yeah, like yeah. The, they're badly written, mm -hmm. they're able to inject wrong identities, and I'll just, you know, as a SAS yeah. compromise, that's the key, right? What you, exactly what you're talking about, how do you deal with that complexity, and to do that part of it right. Mm -hmm. really, um, yeah, I mean, it can be done right, um, that's the thing, and, and you mustn't trust code. Like, that's where you have to have the isolation on top of just the code that's running or in your deployments. Yeah, well, Yep. So I was just think that bit where you're saying you're injecting, so you're taking a Java web token, which might be a, you know, from an <coughs> interactive directory, and you're injecting a tenant field or something in there. Mm -hmm. That's obviously a place where if it wasn't done properly. Uh, well, yeah, but you know you have to trust OAuth two and OpenID to to be giving you and uh, authenticating your your tokens uh, at that point. So that when you get that token, you know it's come from that provider. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Sign your tokens. Sorry, can I? Yeah, I was going to say, I guess, depending on how high up you start, the token can get you to the wrong place. Like, but <coughs> I always hope that we can trust the signature on the token. That's right. Yeah, that's what I mean. You have to, you know, you have to have proper authentication authorization and trust that OIDC flow. Um, you just have to make sure you're putting the right tenant in that in that token. Yeah. The, the next line says. The floor lets a user create JSON web tokens made of a different OAuth scope. So that's where... Yeah, right. So that's... that's yeah. The interesting it's not good. Uh, I haven't had, you know, it's not even out today, so I'm just... Yeah. It's, it's very topical. Cool, take a couple more. Can, can I say something? Um, I've checked out on the IAM and everything else, the policies and everything, and they, they just mentioned cybersecurity. To, to be honest with you guys, uh, I cannot find any information from the internet, but... Chat GPT four actually managed to answer all the questions. <laughs> so I was wondering if you you could probably update some of the places and some some of the things that you know is easier for you to find. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I got the answer for Chat GPT. Yeah, just be careful. Chat GPT is very good and convincing that it's got given you the right answer when actually it's quite often wrong. <laughs> well, thank you for coming along to the first SAS on AWS talk. I hope we have. If, if anyone works in this area and you have something to, to talk about, be it cybersecurity or, um, or even if you want to know about uh, any of these more topics in, in general, um, I've got a few uh, people interested for the talks next year, but it's, it's wide open. So if you want to contribute, I'm really happy to do that. Or if you know somebody who might want to contribute, then please, I want to try and, try and get this series going. So there's, there's, as you can see, there's loads to kind of dive into. Um, so there's particular areas, they don't all have to be as long as this one, but I just really wanted to give you a massive primer on, on the process. Cool. Thank you. Yes, except for, except for January. So first Wednesday of February will be the next one. Yeah, cool.
Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.